Give me a sec to push it live to Facebook here. We are live and welcome everybody to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. Today is the ongoing salute of Turner Classic Movies to Judy Garland, who is the June star of the month. So we thought it would be fun to pay tribute to Judy's musical, The Harvey Girls, and to talk about the real life Harvey houses, the musical, and also make a Harvey house recipe. So. Joining me today are my friends and frequent partners in crime here, Laura Stalker in North Carolina and Lara Gabriel in San Francisco. So thank you ladies for joining me today. Glad to be here, Carrie. Me too. The recipe that we are gonna make is the Kansas Harvey Girl Orange Pancakes. I kind of like to start with the recipe just so I can kind of get that under control. So Laura, tell us about how you came across this recipe and a little bit about it while my, while my griddle warms up here. Sure. So uh, this recipe um, originally comes from this cookbook, which is the Harvey House Cookbook. I say originally, it actually predates this book, but this book is a compilation of recipes from various Harvey House sources, from magazines that were published, from, um, from different uh, newspaper clippings and all that sort of stuff. They, this, these two authors compiled a many, as many recipes as they could find and put them into this fantastic cookbook that documents kind of some of the food history of the Fred Harvey company, which Fred Harvey's legacy we'll talk about in a little bit, but basically he was the first, uh, he, his company was the first hotel chain and restaurant chain in the country. So there's a wealth of recipes and all the Harvey houses had different recipes and things that were aligned with the local ingredients and, and things that they could source through the train, you know, be, having refrigerated train cars that could get ingredients back and forth. So there's all kinds of delicious dishes, a lot of things from the Southwest and all of that in this cookbook. Um, this particular dish goes back to, um, uh, is credited to a gentleman named Henry Stovall, who was the, um, he was the, uh, what they called the vegetable and fruit kind of prep cook at uh, the one of the train station Harvey houses, the, the eating houses in um, St. Louis and at Union Station. And um, I don't have a date for this original recipe, but it was previously published in a small uh, little uh, train cook or cookbook that was made of recipes that were also served on the Super Chief train, which was the dining car or had, you know, the kind of the the train that ran from Chicago to Los Angeles in their dining car called the Turquoise Room, they would have, you know, a, a chef and they would prepare all kinds of dishes and this was one that they would serve there. So um, we just ran through a bunch of recipes and talked through a bunch of options and you and I both thought this one sounded delicious and fun, easy to make. So we thought, let's give this one a try. Well, I'm going to start off making it because my griddle's getting hot here. So I'm going to half the recipe because I'm just cooking for me. So I'm here, I've got two well, I've got one cup actually of the flour and I've also got my sugar in here. Um, the recipe calls for one fourth cup. Again, I reduced that. So I'm going to put this in here. Okay, one, let's see, one teaspoon of baking powder. Put that in here. All right, one half teaspoon of salt. It calls for two large eggs. I'm just going to put, oh, wait, wait, hang on. Okay. So I'm combining my dry ingredients. Okay, in another bowl, whisk together my egg, my orange zest, egg, the orange zest, the orange juice. I squeezed mine with fresh oranges instead of using store-bought. Okay, so the orange juice. I substituted peaches and I squeezed a peach for my peach juice. Oh, oh nice. nice. Yeah. Got milk. And then we've got, let's see, vegetable oil. So I'm going to combine, and I will be posting this recipe. So if people want to make it, they can try it too. Okay, I'm going to whisk these ingredients together. 
Combine mixtures with a few swift strokes. Fold in the orange sections. Do not overmix. The batter will be thin. Okay, so I'm gonna pour our wet ingredients in with the dry ingredients. I think this is a do not overmix uh, a la Dorothy McHale. Remember the Dorothy McHale <laughs> recipe where she where she says, uh, do not overmix, don't. <laughs> That's right. Dorothy McHale means business. And we need yes. to do a standalone Dorothy McHale episode at some point. So those pop yes. were incredibly good. Yes, they were, if you follow Dorothy McHale's advice. Okay, and one cup fresh orange. I have about a or half cup fresh orange. I have about a fourth of a cup here. I'm going to put that in as well. I'm going to try really hard not to overmix. Not easy. But, okay, and I'm gonna put mine on the griddle. Now you ladies already did yours before we went on camera, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So while I'm cooking, Laura, lead us into the Harvey House history and show us your PowerPoint of your journeys across American Harvey Houses. Okay, you wanna go ahead and do that first? Sure, if you want to. I mean, I think it's just such a fascinating topic. It's really a- <laughs> Sure, well, um, well, you know, I love uh, Fred Harvey history. Uh, I saw the movie when I was a little girl and probably like a lot of other folks that are joining us today, just was like this, the movie's great. And then what is all of, what are these Harvey girls? Were they real? Where did they come from? So when um, when I got older and started traveling more, um, I had the uh, this, you know, really started getting into the history when I first went out to the Southwest. And I've been to about 12 plus Kind of Harvey related destinations. Um, there's multiple sites within the Grand Canyon that, you know, are multiple kind of buildings and things that were developed on the South Rim by the Fred Harvey Company. Um, but it's just a really fascinating story. And um, on my recent road trip out to see, uh, to attend the, the film festival, the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival, um, I did a long road trip and went through. Uh, New Mexico and 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 uh, Arizona and California and then stopped at some of the Harvey houses some I'd been to previously and some I went to for the first time so um so I put together a little powerpoint that just shows pictures of those buildings and all of that and I'm happy to like I said I can share it now or we can talk about the film first either way all right, well let's talk about the Harvey houses first because again I'm really I'm really interested to learn more about those and then we'll talk about how those tie into the movie Sure. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. And by the way, if any of you decide to make the orange pancakes, post it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, hashtag Hollywood Kitchen. And it'd be fun to see what everybody else comes up with too. Carrie, it, I need you to make me a co host again. Sure. I'm sorry. All right. Hang on. Hang on. No worries. <laughs> Okay, that should do it. Okay, here we go, everybody. So um, this is some artwork that was created by an il uh, illustrator named Doris Lee. And these particular pieces of artwork were on display at a Harvey House restaurant in Hollywood um, and were done in a celebration of the movie and were um, used on menus and marketing materials and all sorts of things. And I have the, a, a print of the middle one that shows the arrival of the train um, framed in my home, because I just love that print. Um, here are some pi various pictures of me at different little Harvey houses, and we'll get into each of those along the way, but just to, um, different, different sites along the way. Most of the Harvey houses that exist do have some sort of museum or some sort of display case or things like that that kind of tell a little bit about the Harvey history um, and the Harvey girls in particular. And um, some of the places that you can stay uh, have restaurants in them that pay homage to the, to the history and, and cook some of the recipes. And in fact, the recipe that we're making today is served at one of the Harvey houses in uh, Arizona that's still in existence. So this is the Castaneda. These are some postcards and historic postcards of the hotel. This was the first trackside hotel that the Fred Harvey company built. Just a little bit about Fred Harvey. He came to the United States when he was a teenager. He was born in London and he, um, his first job here was in a restaurant. And then he ultimately worked for um, a couple different train lines working kind of as a postal courier and that kind of thing within the, within the railroad 
uh, system and uh, but always loved restaurants and wanted to get back into restaurants and he had a couple restaurants with different partners that didn't work out and ultimately he got in he got connected with the, um, the Atchison Topeka and the Santa Fe rail line and um, had this great idea because the food along the railroad was just awful little uh, restaurant they would have little pop-up restaurants and tents and things that were run by locals that were not that were designed to make money and they had um, they would the, the trains would stop about every hundred miles to refuel or meant to get to drop off mail to pick up passengers and freight and that sort of thing and they would um, the passengers would have about 20 minutes to disembark get something to eat and then get back on the train and in those they would stop at these little local restaurants that would be near the tracks and the food would be things like prairie dog stew which does not sound good uh, they would make these biscuits that they were nicknamed sinkers because they were so hard and heavy you could barely eat them and on top of that they would make the passengers pay in advance for the food and then get the food served to the the passenger would receive their food with about five minutes to eat it so they wouldn't get to eat much and then they would have to get back on the train. Well, the restaurant would just take the plate, scrape off things, cut off or bite marks <laughs> and serve it to the next passenger. So the food was awful. And Fred Harvey saw this in his work with the train line and thought they, we need better food service. So he started opening restaurants, these eating houses, and he had fine china and you know crystal stemware and silver place settings or you know cutlery and all that and um, linens brought in from Europe and all sorts of things and just elevated what a restaurant could be in these somewhat rural Western towns. So um, the Castaneda was his first effort to have a hotel uh, once the restaurant chain became so successful. So this is a historic picture of it. This is it today. It sat vacant for about 70 years. And now there is a hotel, um, a group of people that have restored the La Posada, which we'll get to in a minute that have bought this hotel and they're working to restore it. And they're doing it you know, as they can piece by piece, but um, they've put up the sign and there's about, I think about maybe 10 guest rooms or so that are available to stay in right now that they've completed. There's a restaurant and these are some pictures of the interior and you can, the lobby is on the left. You can see some of the beautiful detailing on the um, ceilings and the columns. The restaurant is the third picture and that's the chandelier that's in the restaurant. Um, and it's a big banquet room and it's just beautiful there. This is also in just down the road from Las Vegas, New Mexico, where uh, the Castaneda was in Hot Springs. This was uh, um, called Montezuma Castle. It was a resort that the Harvey Company built up near some hot springs. Fred Harvey got the, the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe to run a, tra a rail line over to these hot springs and um, they built this resort for their passengers so people could get off the train and go and stay at this resort for a little while. This is about the third hotel built on that site. The building is still there today and it is part of a college campus. Um, I didn't get a chance to go in it, but hopefully my next visit there, I'll get to tour it because they do tours of it. And it looks fantastic, looks really beautiful. Um, so La Fonda, a lot of people are familiar with, it was, a his, it was a hotel before the Harvey Company took it over. But when they took it over, they expanded it and they sort of reinterpreted the design and certainly the interior of it. And Fred Harvey has a very famous um, person who worked for him named Mary Coulter. I'm not sure who, you know, if you folks are familiar with her, her work or not, but she was very instrumental in the decor, the look and feel of these places and making them feel authentic to the Southwest. By the time she came on board with the company, it was very much about storytelling and giving passengers more than just a place to stay, giving them an experience. So they, so she was involved in helping the places look historically appropriate and fit into the landscape with the history and the culture of the Southwest. Um, so these are some recent pictures of the ex, the first two are the exterior. The third picture is their dining room. And then that's a mural. The last picture is a mural that's on the wall. And it's just the most beautiful place to say I loved it there. Um, and these are some of the interior pictures and you can see all the detail of the lighting, the mantles, um, just the whole, it, it's just a very much an experience to stay in one of these properties, which was the intent of Mary Coulter and the Fred Harvey Company. Um, 
I'm sure a lot of folks have been to the Painted Desert or Petrified Forest National, National Park. Within the park is a, ho a former hotel that's called the Painted Desert Inn. It was also a property that Fred Harvey, that already existed, but Fred, the Fred Harvey Company took over. And when they did, they revamped it, did the same sort of thing that they did with La Fonda. And these are some recent pictures of the exterior of it. Um, it kind of fits really into the landscape. Parts of it are two story and um, you, it's deceptive how big it is once you get inside it and the views are fantastic. The third picture shows the rooms that, the rooms that were um, the entry doors to the Harvey girls rooms, to their dormitory rooms. And then the last picture shows a pic, uh, one of the rooms. So they were kind of suites, connecting suites. These are some um, interior shots. The first two pictures are of the kitchen. That's the sink that they use to do all their cooking, that little sink. Uh, there's some of the branded napkins that they use. And then that's one of the, like kind of the lunch counter room at the end. These are just some of samples of the decor. Um, they worked a lot with, um, uh, you know, representing indigenous art and working with indigenous artists to, to kind of interpret these places and put up murals and do carvings and all sorts of things to really, again, be authentic to the Southwest. Um, and it's just a beautiful place to visit. It has been restored really well by the National Park Service. La, La Posada is one of the most famous kind of well-known Harvey houses today. Um, the same group that has, is working on the Castaneda is the group that did that has been working on this property. And um, this was designed completely interiors, the architecture, all of that by Mary Coulter for the, working for the Fred Harvey Company. This was what she considered her masterpiece. These are some exterior shots. It has very extensive grounds on it. Um, and it's just, they're doing a lot of really great work there. And the restaurant, um, these are a few more pictures of the exterior of the gardens. And there's sunken gardens and gardens all around it, water features and all of that. And the train stops there, so you can still take the Amtrak there. These are some pictures of the interior. Lots of celebrities stayed at this hotel. Um, I have stayed there three times. Um, the first time, I can't remember whose room I was in the first time, but the second time I was in the Howard Hughes room. <laughs> and then the last time I was in the Betty Grable room. And the folks that, that manage the hotel make sure that, you know, it's truly the room they stayed in. So that's really fun. There's a lot of Hollywood history there. But these are some shots of the interior. The last picture is the turquoise room, which again was the name of the dining car on the Super Chief that they have used that name for the name of their restaurant. And that is where they serve this pancake recipe. They serve it more like crepes. They add orange marmalade and roll the crepes, fill them with cottage cheese and sprinkle them with almonds. And it is fantastic. One of my favorite breakfasts on my road trip. Um, this is the El Garces and Needles. It is, the building has been restored, but the interior is not yet. Um, the city has plans to do that, to make it some sort of municipal building. They've gotten grant money to fix it up. But um, these are some recent shots that I took of the exterior of it. And I believe the train may still stop there. Um, folks that are more familiar with needles than I am may know the answer to that. But this is the fountain. There's a fountain there. So there's a couple pictures of that. And then it's got needles written on the side of it, but it's a really beautiful building. This is the um, Casa del Desierto, and I'm sure I butchered that, I apologize. Um, this one is in Barstow, and it is um, in really great shape. Um, it has a lot of the original interior features, unlike the El Garces, which kind of looks like it's gutted when you peek in the windows. But um, these are some pictures. Uh, the first two are of the, the front of it, and there's this great kind of historic marker there. It had the, the interior has these gorgeous copper light fixtures throughout it. There's sconces, there's big hanging ones, there's these kind of triple ones that hang on the wall, and they are gorgeous. And they have all these copper detailings like over the radiator vents and things. Um, they have a little exhibit to uh, the Harvey his, the Harvey girls to the film, and uh, our girl Angela Lansbury has been there and signed this this particular uh, picture to the Barstow Harvey House. Um, I'm not sure when, why, when she was there, but um, but anyway, that's really neat. And then, last but not least, there's lots of merchandise. Harvey uh, the Harvey Company was the largest purveyor of Native American arts and crafts. Um, in the country when it was operational. They did a lot to celebrate that art and that um, those, those uh, you know, again, pieces of craft and sold that in lots of their hotels and the shops 
all the, in the Grand Canyon and all of that and worked with weavers and potters and jewelry makers. And there's a big tradition of collecting Harvey, Fred Harvey merchandise. I'm a very small collector, but would love a bigger collection and then working on that. Um, but there's a great store if you're in Santa Fe called Santa Fe Antiques. My friend Everett is one of the owners of it. And this is just kind of giving you a sample of all the different types of merchandise and things that the Fred Harvey company made. They sold their own china. They sold purses and jewelry and all sorts of things. Um, and, and again, were branded and, and interpreted in the styles of the Southwest and then worked with, with Native American artists to create pieces. So if you're ever in Santa Fe, this is a great place to check out. Um, so that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much for kind of taking us on this virtual tour of the Harvey houses. <laughs> So I tried to talk fast, but we had plenty of time to talk more. <laughs> yeah, let's dive into the movie, ladies, and let's talk about the movie and talk about the differences between the real life Harvey girls and the ones played by Judy Garland, Angela Lansbury, and the rest of the cast in the film. Sure. Uh, how do how do we want to start? Do do we want to talk about like when we first saw the movie? Yeah, when you first when saw the that? movie. Yeah, when did you first see it and discover oh, it? Oh well. I mean, I think that I probably first saw it when I was about 10 um, because I, I had seen all of Judy Garland's movies by the time I was 11. Um, uh, seriously, like- uh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, not surprised I had, at all. And I love you yeah. even more for knowing, now that I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it um, she was my, my I don't even I don't even know how to ex explain she was she was my my gateway really into into classic movies for North Star yes, yes exactly and and um so when I was 10 I got a you know a, a cassette you know in the bargain bin of Borders bookstore um you know and listened to it on the car ride on New Year's Eve you know 19 whatever that must have been 1995 or whatever um and the minute she sang on that tape it was like funk like I was it was it was that Game was over. It. yes and I I had known her from Wizard of Oz and from Meet Me in St. Louis but hearing her sing outside of the movies like you know sing her her music uh was just a completely different story and so in a year over the course of the year, I I watched all her movies. I was lucky to have a supportive a supportive uh, family and friend network who uh, helped me find the movies, and I, I had seen them all. So I was probably either ten or eleven. I was I, I would think probably ten um, when I saw the Harvey Girls, and um, I loved it. I've always loved it. Uh, I think it's um, I think it's funny. I think it's clever. It's um, you know, there's certain parts of it that don't really hold up very well today, but you know, uh, it's it, it it is what it is, and I think it's I think it's a really wonderful movie. Uh, and and um, my sister, who has grown up with Judy Garland via me, um, <laughs> uh, told me uh, not so long ago that she uh, what did she say? She said she she like taught somebody how to sing on the Atchison Topeka and the Santa Fe or something <laughs> like. <laughs> she, she said, I blame you. <laughs> they had no choice. Yes, exactly. No um, but anyway, yeah, that's the first time I uh, I saw the movie. I have some I have some cool like facts about it, like a little yes, intro, if we wanted to do that. Although I don't know if we maybe Laura should say when she first saw the movie and then I yes, can go yes, you say that when you first saw it and then we'll go. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, kind of like I said earlier, I, I don't know the exact year. My first Judy Garland film was Wizard of Oz and I was Total, totally obsessed and probably still am. Uh, love the film and love uh, just kind of saw, I was probably like five or six when I saw that for the first time. And then it was kind of like, where can I find her movies? How do I, how do I get these movies? You know, and I tried, I, you know, tried to see, I didn't see them all in a year, <laughs> which I'm very impressed by. Um, but, um, you know, it took me a little while, but, but I got through them and each one, it was like, I would watch it and then be obsessed with that one. So now I've got to just watch it over and over and over and over again. Um, but this was one I saw early and just loved. I mean, I loved the train travel. I loved the story of the women, you know, kind of all the kind of a female labor force. I thought that was really interesting. And we can talk about that a little bit in, in a minute. But um, just kind of all of the 
the dynamic of the women. Um, you know, this is such this is such a film about women, and you know, yeah, there are male characters, and they're they're. I mean, I love John Hodiak, who who doesn't? He's gorgeous, um, and Ray Bolger, so. But but it's about the women and the dynamic of the women, and I just really gravitated toward that, and just was fascinated by it. And like I said, was like, who are these Harvey girls? And went to my library and like tell me everything, find everything I can. And then when I started traveling, um, I love the national parks, so. The kind of the the Harvey history and the National Parks history that's a great intersection for me, um, covering multiple interests. So it just kind of all came together. And like I said, I love pursuing the Harvey history now and going to this, even if the building's torn down, like this is where it was, this is what it looked like, this is, you know, all of that. So um, this film was great to kind of introduce me to that and get me, um, you know, down that path of learning learning all this other history, really fascinating history about our country and uh, women. I think I first saw the Harvey Girls when I was in film school and which would have been about the mid nineties. And we, we, I took a class called How Hollywood Speaks to the American Woman. And this was one of the films that we watched. And I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I, my school was like five minutes from the, the La Fonda. And, mm -hmm. I, I really loved the film. I, I love Judy, of course, and have since I was little and saw Wizard of Oz too. But another thing that struck me as, as it did for you all is the female workforce. Because as we know, back in the old days, women did not exactly have a ton of options for career or work necessarily. You could count on one hand. So the idea of these young women kind of getting on a train and leaving their town and coming across America and finding work. I was really excited by that idea. And I thought that was so fascinating. And then of course, I was intrigued by the Judy Garland versus Angela Lansbury. You've got the good girls versus the bad girls. And I always, I don't know, I feel kind of frustrated in movies how women are always pitted against each other. And you know, that film was certainly an example because there's a the big fight scene and everything. But I just love the movie. I thought it was so fun and so entertaining. And it just, it holds up. I mean, I know there's issues with it, but it's still a fun film to watch. It still hasn't lost any of its entertainment value. And the other thing I, I wanted to uh, sort of piggyback on what you said, Carrie, about the um, about the Angela Lansbury character. And spoiler alert, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, you know, plug your ears, but she ends up being good. You know, she ends up being the... Um, uh, you know, she she's she's a saloon woman. She's not supposed to under the code. You know, she's not really supposed to be this virtuous character. But at the end of the movie, she's a she she's like a good guy. So um, so I think that that's I think that's kind of a cool little twist. Oh, definitely. And of course, the famous actress said to Pika in the Santa Fe song, and that's just such a memorable sequence, such a brilliant piece of you know filmmaking from Hollywood's golden age of musicals. You know, she did that in one take. Mm -hmm. That that song is done in one take, all the way up to the to the tempo change. There's one cut, mm. and and uh, and so Judy uh, apparently apparently they shot it twice, and. Um, I don't know if this was the first or the second take, but apparently Judy was like on it the both both times, and she was famous for that. Mm -hmm. She, you know, she had um, uh, she had this ability to hear something once or learn something once, and then she had it. Just just part of her genius. Oh yeah, that's the right word. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So tell us the facts that you're going to tell us, Laura, about. Oh yeah, sure. So I I was just gonna okay, good. It's it's four thirty. This might be a good a good time to do it because the movie starts at five, right? Um, so uh, I just wanted to just talk a little bit about about the movie and the background of it and what you know the people who are in it and uh, you know people who produced it and and all that. So it was interestingly. I always think of the Harvey Girls as 1945, but it's actually 1946. It was actually released in January of 1946, but it was filmed in 1945. It was filmed in early 1945, from January to June of um, of 1945, which actually actually late December of 44, I think, into June of um, of 1945, which is a really long shoot. Um, 
and that was uh i mean they had a lot to do you know it was a big set and lots of dance numbers and, th and things like this um but it was filmed in 45 released in january of 46 um and the background of it judy was originally or, judy originally didn't want the role she wanted um instead to play the role that went to lucille bremer in uh yolanda and the thief which was being filmed at the same time and there were going to be scheduled conflicts and and things like that and, and so she wanted that but mgm convinced her to take this one instead which i think is better um they told her it would be a better role and i think it is a better role um i think they were right about that um and the uh the production was like i said it was long uh whatever that is six months just pretty exhausting, especially with all the musical numbers and 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 things like that. But the um, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, which we talked about, was done in one take mostly. It was, it was cut at the tempo change, and after the tempo change, it's like thirty more seconds, and then that's it. But it won best song, written by Johnny Mercer and uh, Harry Warren, and the score. Uh, the score was was Lenny Hayton who was the MGM, one of the MGM um, musical directors at the time, eventually ended up being married to Lena Horne, as we, we, we were talking about Lena Horne before the, uh, before the, the, the broadcast here. Uh, and interestingly, what I was sort of thinking about the, on the Atchison Topeka and the Santa Fe and how it feels a little bit Busby Berkeley-esque, um, but it's not. It's, it's uh, Robert Alton was the choreographer on uh, that number, but it feels, you know, the the cowboys and the lassos and things going around. It just, it feels like it could have been Busby Berkeley. Uh, like we said, it was done in one take. And a little bit about the people who were in it. So the the famous people. There are several famous people who in this movie. There's a reunion with Ray Boulder, right, who played the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, and he has all kinds of wonderful dance. See, even when he's not dancing, even when he's not dancing, he has he has such a such a rubber band body. He, he the, the scene with the horseshoe where he um uh you know where he is you know where Virginia O'Brien is uh, talking to him about the horseshoe and he you know has to he, he throws the horseshoe around. It's just, anyway, it's it's you can tell that he's a dancer uh, and and a really good one. And uh, Laura was noting before uh, the show that it's really amazing to watch the extras in the party scene. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Laura. Well, no, I was just, I was, we were talking about it before, before we started and just kind of things we love about the movie. And I've rewatched it two times and a half, two and a half in preparation for this. And um, picking, you know, it's fun to kind of, when you know a movie well, to kind of start trying to look at things you don't typically kind of observe. And in his big dance number, solo dance number, when folks are watching it tonight, especially if you've seen the movie before and know it, I really encourage you to watch the crowd because everyone in the crowd is loving Ray Bolger's dance number. And they're kind of, you can see them kind of anticipate things because I'm sure they've watched him do it a couple times, you know, um, in the shooting of it. But just, they are, they are so into it. And it made me even more into it, watching it again, like, oh, you know, look at his face or look at that extra space or whatever. So I really encourage folks to do that because it's just really fun to kind of see as much as I'm enjoying the movie as a viewer, to see the people on the set enjoying that dance number, you know, as much as I'm doing it. It's just kind of a fun thing, I think. I love that. I love that um, that that fun little thing to do with when you're watching a movie is watch the people in the background because yeah. often, yeah, often often they, they are seeing it and, and having fun. Mm -hmm. And and I noticed this recently with Pigskin Parade, which was Judy Garland's first feature feature film. When she sings the Texas Tornado in Pigskin Parade, the people in the back are like in awe of this fourteen year old kid. Um, it's it's very cool to see. Right, and so yeah. Oh, I, one other just thing, real quick, about the, the the whole party sequence, which is for those who haven't seen the film, there's a part where they host kind of a host the locals in a kind of in, in the Harvey House, which was common. A lot of folks local folks would go to 
eat at Harvey houses, not just folks on the train. Um, so that's that's appropriate, historically accurate. But um, in the kind of medley of songs, they play Skip to Malou, which, you know, which is kind of fun knowing that that, you know, Meet Me in St. Louis came out before that and had Skip to Malou. And that was what, that was something I don't think I had caught that before. And I was listening to the music, I was like, oh gosh, there's Skip to Malou. So that was a fun, new little fun discovery, I think, from rewatching it for this. Yeah, that's fun. And of course, you know, Harvey Girls was Judy's, well, it it was Mimi St. Louis and then The Clock and then uh, a her Harvey follow-up Girls. musical. Too. Yeah, her, her follow-up <laughs> musical. <it> yeah. <laughs> right. So it was the, the next one. And then wh- the, another thing that Laura and I were talking about before the uh, before the show was Angela Lansbury and how she's dubbed. Um, she's dubbed in the movie, which seems really weird to us today because we think Angela Lansbury is this Broadway star um you know and she's she's got this phenomenal powerful beautiful singing voice but we have to remember that this was really early in Angela Lansbury's career and who knows for for one thing so I I actually did a little bit a little bit more research on it after because that's just who I am um after Laura and I were talking and uh people were saying that they thought that her singing voice wasn't right for the character which seems, you know, fine. Yeah, that's that seems right. But also, I don't think, and this is what we were talking about before, I don't think that maybe anybody even knew. Maybe even she didn't know um, that she could sing the way she can sing. Because she had been, I mean, she'd done Gaslight. You know, like she was a dramatic actress. Uh, and, you know, National Velvet. So, um so yeah, she was she was dubbed, which you know seems like a real loss. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would lo- have loved to hear Angela Lansbury uh, sing "Oh You Kid," um, but but um, another <laughs> another really interesting thing that I found though too, I, I want to talk a little bit about Kate Thompson because Kate Thompson and Judy and Judy were best friends. I mean, they had met they had met several years before this. Um, and Kate Thompson had been hired in 1943 to be um, a uh, vocal vocal coach and arranger at at uh, MGM. And uh, in so this this I think was the first time that there had been an arrangement of Kay Thompson's that Judy performed. Um, and and you can really see, I think that her time working with Kay Thompson from 1943 on uh, really marks the second half of her MGM career. You can see the difference. You can see the difference uh, between, you know, her Mickey Rooney things and how much she was working with Roger Edens and this more adult kind of more robust uh, voice and delivery that she, exhibited when she um when she worked with Kate Thompson so it um actually okay so I think that this was the first time that an audience heard an audience the audience heard a Kay Thompson arrangement done by Judy but she had before and this is kind of mind-blowing um <laughs> before she had filmed Ziegfeld Follies of 1946 which didn't come out until later um and and Zeke of 1946 she did a number that had been arranged by Kate Thompson so it wasn't the first time she had worked with her or done an arrangement it was just the first time that, her, that the audience had heard it um and and uh she she and Kay were like buddies buddies to the end and they really influenced each other like if you if you watch Funny Face and you watch Kate Thompson doing uh Clap Your Hands it's I mean, it, it, that's like Judy, Judy circa 1962, you know, so it's, it's just uh, incredible. Anyway, so she did the arrangements for this and you can, you can tell. Uh, yeah, um, let me see if I have any other notes here. Oh, fun thing. Um, okay, well, we have Sid Charisse, right? Um, Sid Charisse is one of the, sort of one of the, the friends yeah, sort of the, the film is based off a book that came out that was done by the Harvey Company, kind of, they supported the publication of this book, and in the book there are three female, female leads in the, in the book, so that kind of mirrors that part of the film, mirrors that part of the book, that's so cool. that's why they kind of focus on those three characters as kind huh. of the main 
Harvey Girl Women in to, to have talk you read, about. Have you read the book? No, I haven't. I have it on order. I was going to ask. I was going to ask. Because I want a copy of it. And yeah. I almost bought a copy on my trip, but it was like an original, like first edition. And it was like, you know, $300. And I was like, ah, okay. Uh, but yeah. I, found, I found a cheaper, more recent version, but I'm getting that so I can read it and compare. Because apparently it's a lot more, a lot more scandalous. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask how, <laughs> would how similar, it's not the movie is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to the, to the book because, I don't know, the movie, the movie's pretty benign. Sure. It's, yeah. Um, but so. I'm curious about what the difference too between the Harvey Girl depiction in the movie versus the real life Harvey Girls. Like, for example, I was always, I've always read they couldn't wear makeup. They couldn't have their nails. Yeah, um, in fact, were, in fact, I can kind of, these, this isn't, I don't know that this is totally the formal list of rules, just to kind of everybody, you know, to give you a little kind of timeline, Harvey girls, they started having Harvey girls, girls work in the restaurants and eating houses and all that. And around the early 1880s, they had employed men and kind of local women at some of the more populated cities where they had Harvey houses, but the men out West had conflicts the male waiters with the patrons and there were fights and other things. So one of the, the Harvey house, uh, one of the ones in New Mexico was like, we're going to start trying to use women. We think that would be better. And so that the Fred Harvey company was like, well, that's a great idea. Let's do that throughout the company. So they did solicit women to, you know, and they reached out to women from the East, from the Midwest. They didn't hire local. You would get hired, you know, in Topeka, or where, and then you would be sent to somewhere. You would work on a six, six to six months to one year contract. Um, as part of your contract, once your contract ended, you got to take a trip anywhere that the At Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe Railroad went. You could take a little vacation, and then you could sign back up for another term. Uh, around the beginning of the program, girls were paid. Um, it was seventeen fifty. Um, I think that was the monthly rate. I've got it down here somewhere, but, um, but yes, yeah, so, but that was really big money. So at the time, and they had room and board that, you know, they were, had the lived on dorm dormitories, either like connected to the hotel or across the street from that. Um, so they had that, all of that covered for them. They worked six to seven days a week or a week, um, and worked kind of a split shift each day. Um, some of the rules were, you were right, Carrie, um, no, I'll, you had to be single. You had to be between the ages of 18 and 30. They did employ only white women up until World War II. Um, and that changed uh, at that point. But you lived, you had to live on site in the dormitory. You could, you had to have your nails manicured once a week. Um, let's see, you had to keep your uniform spotless. You were issued your uniform. And we talked a little bit about that before the show. It was typically in the beginning of the company and for most of the history of the Fred Harvey company, the uniform was a black dress, um, almost floor length with a white apron and then a, a black bow tie. And that varied over time. They had kind of a summer outfit that was all white and a little shorter. And then in the forties and fifties, they started doing more regionally specific dress. Um, so things inspired by Southwestern, you know, clothing and that kind of thing, uh, embroidered floral tops and things, depending on the location. Um, but you had, you had a 10 p.m. curfew. You had to keep your dorm room dusted. <laughs> you had to make sure the orange juice was freshly squeezed. You had to wear a mandatory hairnet. You were not allowed to talk to other Harvey girls while you worked. You could only talk to the patrons. Um, you had to make sure the coffee was always fresh. The napkin must be precisely folded. Tables must be set um, precisely. And you had to be courteous to all, always be courteous to all of the um, patrons. So those were some of the, some of the rules. Um, like, it's like the number. It's like the, <laughs> the train must be fed. The train must, well, it's really great, you know, rewatching the movie and now, you know, that I have more of a knowledge. I mean, I'm, I'm no, by no means an expert on this subject matter. I just find it really interesting. Um, but, you know, they have, um, they do a really good job of kind of establishing some of the elements that 
or, you know, in those first few numbers in the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe talking about women coming from all over and some of the reasons why they came, you know, they had failed romances, they had uh, wanted, you know, adventure, they wanted to see something of the world, they wanted to just, you know, leave kind of the expectations and what was the, the, the life that was unfolding for them at home. They wanted something different. And a lot of these people had not traveled. I mean, there, you know, there are some who had never, you know, left the town they were in. And then they get this big adventure to go take the train to what was really the sort of still the Wild West uh, in the 1880s. And uh, one of the things that, you know, it's interesting in the movie that it has the setup of these pristine Harvey girls and these saloon girls, because when they started, in the 1880s with Harvey girls, actually women waitresses were, were looked down upon. They were considered, you know, um, not quite so, soil doves, the term that was used, but they, were, they weren't um, socially, that socially acceptable. So the Fred Harvey company really tried to change that image by instituting these strict rules, by having the women live in the dormitories and dressing them basically like nuns you know, <laughs> with the exception of a, you know, the habit, but, um, but that was part of kind of the, the branding of it, but ultimately this, this opera, this career opera, this opened just a big career opportunity for women. Over a hundred thousand women worked as Harvey girls over the course of the company. And, um, there were other things that the company did to elevate women. I mentioned the architect, Mary Coulter. There were other people in the, in management that worked with the Harvey girls that hired them and all that, that were, that were women. And then ultimately in the 1920s, the Fred Harvey company started a tour company called Indian Detours and they employed women to give guided tours from their hotels. So this, this company did a lot to give women opportunity at a time when women didn't have a lot of opportunity. And that's just a really interesting story. And, and some women became Harvey girls because they wanted to find a husband, you know, which the movie sort of depicts. And to some, and Fred Harvey was sometimes dubbed the Cupid of the West for, you know, for that reason. But, um, but it's just a really fascinating history. And the movie gets a lot of it right. It's just that there's more, a little more to it, you know. Laura, I wanted to, I wanted um, to ask, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, sure. You said that you said that um, it wasn't until World War II that they started hiring non-white women. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, was the were the Harvey houses and were the Harvey houses maybe considered part of the the train system and thus a part of the war effort. Like um, well, you hit on something really interesting. So the the Harvey houses started having a bit of a decline um, they, uh, around the, uh, the Great Depression. And it was the war that really, in fact, a lot of houses had closed in the 20s. Some of the eating houses, not so much the hotels, but the eating houses that were just trackside restaurants. A lot of those had closed and they had, uh, but then when World War II came, troops were transported by the train. That was the primary means of getting the troops to different bases. And that just brought this huge resurgence of, um, of you know, needing places to eat. So a lot of the ones that had closed reopened. And, um, and it was considered, you know, a lot of the Harvey girls that are still with us today that lived at that time, consider what they did as part of the war effort. And um, that opened the opportunities for, um, for uh, you know, Native American and Hispanic women to start getting hired as Harvey girls. And um, there's a great documentary that I highly recommend to anybody who's interested. It's called The Harvey Girls Opportunity Bound. Um, some of it's available on YouTube, but it's just a really great documentary that really, inter they interview a lot of women that worked in the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s and 60s before the Harvey company closed or was sold in 68. And they talk a lot about the war effort and kind of how they felt they were, you know, instrumental in that. And um, some of the Harvey girls went on to then work in other capacities during World War II. Yeah, because I, I know that, you know, Roosevelt made the the uh, the order that all every every industry that worked for the war effort had to be integrated. So I, mm -hmm. I wondered if that had something to do with um, it. Yeah, I don't know if it was like official that, yeah. that they had to. Um, but, you know, the, the Harvey company had this kind of 
the whole company started on a handshake with the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. There was, you know, after a while, there was a contract uh, official thing. But for the first 10 years of it, it was on a handshake. And um, that's kind of how the thing worked. And they had a leasing deal. The, the way the, that they kind of made money to, one, to some degree is they didn't, they didn't really own a lot of their buildings. They leased the property from the, I, I guess they technically owned, they built the buildings, but they leased the property from the railroad. And they would sometimes construct the depot and that kind of thing to match the hotel or the eating house and that kind of thing. So there's, you know, there's a bit of a gray area. I'll have to look into that because that's a really great question. Yeah, that, it, it's, that's really cool. I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting history. Mm -hmm. um, We've got 10 minutes before the movie starts on TCM. Yeah, so. well, one thing I wanted to, one thing I wanted to say um, is that, that um, I was interested in, I was interested in whether, um, I knew that the timing was really close with filming um, the Harvey Girls and Judy marrying Vincent Minnelli, uh, and I found that they um, they married eleven days after shooting wrapped on the Harvey Girls. Uh, so shooting wrapped on June fourth, nineteen forty five, and they married on uh, June fifteenth. So um, so they were very much very much together <laughs> while, while the Harvey Girls was going on. Um, and I, I thought that Judy might have been pregnant with Liza, but it's, it doesn't really match up. It's like it's like almost there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So she I, she got pregnant quite quickly after she married Vincent Minnelli. What else other than the faces of the extras for people that maybe haven't seen the movie or haven't seen it in a while, what else would you suggest people look for? when they watch it? I think that the, um, I think the dancing is great. I mean, they have, they have, um, it, it's interesting because the, the, the choreography, Robert Alton, we don't really think about him as being this great choreographer, but he's also working with Ray Bolger and, uh, you know, and, and some pretty heavy duty dancers, but, but, you know the it's it's really top notch choreography and dancing. I think, um, I yeah, would, it's with I Sid Reese and you know all the and, and of course Angela Lansbury, who later we found out really can dance. Yeah, I would add the um, Judy's humor in this. She's really funny, and Judy's one who, to me, she's funnier the more you really pay attention with the way she uses her body and her face and her gestures gesture, gesture, oh, tongue tied. Uh, <laughs> but um, she's just, she's got, there's so much happening when she's on screen. And it, sometimes it's subtle, but it's like, it really, really pay attention. You really see kind of the depth of her humor and how much she puts into her characters and just the whole scenes of her going into uh, the saloon. And there was, there's a funny moment actually in this documentary about the Harvey girls where one of the Harvey girls said, yeah, Judy Garland would not have been a Harvey girl going into to a saloon. She would have been fired. <laughs> yeah. So all of the whole like, you know, dealing who, those who have seen it, getting the, the the mead and all of that stuff back, the things that kind of the back and forth with the saloon, go you know going in there and all and, and going to like meet John Hodiak at the beginning of the film and confronting him and all of that, just her humor in those scenes, you know, pay attention to those because those are that's just so fun and it's she just really plays that up quite well, I think. Yeah, there aren't very many times in MGM, there aren't very many movies during Judy's MGM years where she really gets to show how funny she is. She's hilarious. And, she and, cracks me up. Oh. And, and she was known in the industry, you know, the people who knew her said that she that Judy Garland was the funniest woman that they'd ever met. Lucy the Ball said that. that Lucy, yeah, well, Lucy yeah, Ball was like, Lucy I'm Ball not funny. Said, uh, Judy, she said, Judy Garland is funny. Judy Garland makes me look like a mortician. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, uh, and you can see it like in her later interviews when she's being interviewed on the Jack Parr show and, and, and all those, it's just so funny. She was, she was a, a comedic genius. I mean, we can yes. use the word, but it's true. Um, and, and she doesn't really get to show it in, 
in many of her MGM movies. There are a few, there are a few moments like, like yeah. in Harvey Girls. And I'm trying to think there was one the other day that I was watching and I was like- Well, Easter Parade with her. Oh yes, in in Easter Parade face. for They're sure. Doing the fish face, I love that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, and some moments in in the good old summertime. Oh yeah, oh, um, yeah. yeah. But uh, but no, there was one the other day. Here's how my pancakes turned out, by the way. Oh yeah, I gotta show you show my camera. The camera. <laughs> oh my gosh, yours look amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, mine. I made I made little ones. I don't know if you can see. Mine's so cute. I think so. I'm wondering if I should have added a little more vegetable oil or a little more milk. Mine are kind of thick. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to go online later and anybody who's made comments, I know we didn't get to do a and a today, uh, but I'll try to answer any questions. And if anybody wants to talk Harvey history with me or any of that, feel free to message me. Um, I love I love talking about it and love sharing pictures and experiences about all of that. And same here with Judy or anything, you know, so everybody, everybody is welcome to. And thank you, thank you to everyone who watches these. I mean, I'm, I'm just having so much fun doing these and I hope people are enjoying them and really having a good time either with the food and or the film history because it's such a fun way to share all of these things with all of you. It's, it's really so wonderful that you're doing this, Carrie. I mean, it's, and I know it started as sort of a pandemic fun thing, but it's really turned into something big and something wonderful. Well, you've created this whole community and I've met so many people thanks to you doing this and having me on a time or two, you know, and it's, yeah. it's just wonderful to kind of get to spend time with, with my friends and gab about Harvey houses and Judy Garland and eat pancakes. I mean, come on. What could be better than that? What could be better than that? Nothing. And these Nothing. are good pancakes too. They've got a really lovely orange citrusy flavor and they're really good. I'm going to eat a lot of them while I watch this video in a minute. Yeah, and it's really delightful. It's really delightful to uh, be able to cook these recipes, to have the recipes be a tie-in to the stars. And it's a really good idea. Definitely. Yeah. So it's about a minute or two till the movie starts. So um, yeah. thank you all. Thank you, Laura and Lara, for joining me. Thank you to everybody for watching and please stay tuned for more food fun and film history from Hollywood Kitchen. Bye. Bye. See you on TCM. <laughs> Enjoy the movie. Yeah. Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs>